SpaceX just pulled off a clever pivot after a major explosion crippled its test site. They're now transforming the orbital launch mount into an improvised test stand for Starship, installing a game-changing internal upgrade in the Super Heavy booster, and rapidly building the Gigabay factory, while the U.S. Air Force quietly scraps a Starship landing pad in the Pacific. Let's break it all down. With the Massey's test site destroyed in the Ship 36 explosion, SpaceX has been forced to adapt quickly. In a bold workaround, they're now repurposing the orbital launch mount to conduct Starship upper stage static fires, an unconventional but necessary shift to maintain development pace. At the heart of this plan is a Starship transport stand being converted into a static fire stand. Currently stationed at the launch site, engineers are reinforcing it with bracing structures to secure the Raptor vacuum engines, which are vulnerable to displacement or structural flexing during firings without proper support. The stand's leg extensions were trimmed to ensure it could properly interface with the OLM, which was originally built to support the Super Heavy booster. To accommodate the new configuration, SpaceX has removed all booster hold-down clamps from the OLM. This clears space for the modified stand and allows installation of new fluid and electrical interfaces required for Starship. Because the Starship's quick disconnect is incompatible with that of the booster, SpaceX cannot reuse the existing booster QD arm to fuel and pressurize the ship. Instead, a new Starship-specific QD unit, recently spotted at the production site, is expected to be installed directly onto the OLM. Work is already underway at the launch mount, where crews have begun installing a support structure for the new Starship QD system. Flex hoses were spotted at the site, which will soon be connected to the new Starship QD setup for fueling and pressurization. Propellant lines from the tank farm will be rerouted to this new system, enabling the controlled transfer of liquid methane, liquid oxygen, nitrogen purge, and high-pressure helium during static fire operations. Recent venting activity at the launch site suggests that work to reroute propellant plumbing is well underway, with segments of the new feed system already undergoing pressure and leak testing during integration. While the tank farm infrastructure supplying the propellant remains unchanged, the dynamics of feeding a ship differ from those of a booster. Starship smaller tank volumes and tighter pressure margins require more precise flow control. As a result, the software governing valve timing pump speeds, and flow regulation must be reprogrammed and recalibrated to match the ship's propellant handling profile. The first candidate for this test campaign is Ship 37, currently located inside Mega Bay 2, where SpaceX appears to be completing engine integration, with both sea level and vacuum Raptor engines recently delivered to the facility. One static fire is complete, Ship 37 will pair with Booster 16, a vehicle already cryo-tested and hot-fired, for Flight 10. Next in line is Ship 38, which will undergo cryo-proof testing on the temporary stand, return for engine installation, and then perform its own static fire. It's expected to launch with Booster 15, the vehicle that flew and was caught during Flight 8. Since Booster 15 has already been flight-proven, it will likely require only a static fire validation, with no additional cryo-testing needed to qualify for Flight 11. However, it is important to note that Booster 15's static fire cannot proceed until the launch mount is restored to its original booster-compatible configuration after ship testing. Though it introduces a short delay, the reconfiguration process is still faster than waiting months for Massey's to be rebuilt. Meanwhile, recovery operations are underway at the Massey's test site with teams actively clearing the debris field, damaged ground support equipment, including pumps, vaporizers, and heat exchangers, is being removed for replacement. The main propellant tanks appear intact but remain under close inspection for structural integrity and leak tightness, with venting observed in recent days suggesting ongoing liquid nitrogen pressurization tests. If any tanks are found to be compromised, they will be replaced during the reconstruction phase. The rebuild plan includes restoring or upgrading the destroyed Starship static fire stand and installing a new gantry system to support future Block 3 vehicles, as Block 2 hardware will be retired after Flight 11. In parallel, SpaceX is conducting targeted failure investigations into the cause of the Ship 36 explosion, which has been traced back to the rupture of a composite overwrapped pressure vessel, or COPV, inside the nose cone region. The recent incident at the McGregor test site saw a COPV violently explode and soar into the air, likely part of a controlled destructive test aimed at understanding failure thresholds and propagation mechanisms. According to preliminary findings, the COPV on Ship 36 failed below its designated proof pressure, ruling out overpressurization and pointing to possible material flaws or structural degradation. By intentionally overpressurizing COPVs to failure, SpaceX gathers critical telemetry on stress profiles, rupture mechanics, 
and pre-failure signals, data used to improve design margins, manufacturing quality, and overall COPV reliability. For a full breakdown of the Ship 36 explosion, including failure analysis and test site damage, check out my earlier videos linked in the description. In a major leap forward, SpaceX has begun implementing one of the most significant structural upgrades to the Super Heavy booster since the start of the Starship program. The first Block 3 Super Heavy, Booster 18, is now being stacked inside the Mega Bay, and this week, it received a key new feature, a massive transfer tube. The transfer tube is essentially a long internal pipe that runs from the upper methane tank down through the liquid oxygen tank to supply methane directly to the Raptor engines. The tube recently installed in Booster 18 is nearly 40 meters in length, about the same size as the entire first stage of a Falcon 9 rocket. Elon Musk emphasized the engineering challenge, stating the tube has to be very buff, as it is subject to extreme loads, and a single leak would be game over. That underscores how critical structural integrity is, since the tube not only carries fuel, but must also survive intense internal pressures and flight stresses. And it's more of a header tank system than a conventional transfer tube. Although the exact internal structure hasn't been disclosed, the enlarged transfer tube likely contains separate storage volumes or header tanks for methane and oxygen dedicated to supporting critical in-flight maneuvers. This represents a significant departure from earlier designs, where smaller, separate header tanks were housed within the main tanks and used exclusively for landing burns. With the new Block 3 design, these header tanks are now integrated directly into the central transfer tube, effectively increasing the amount of propellant set aside for critical maneuvers. This updated system may not only handle landing burns, but also supply propellant for the boost back burn, marking a major functional shift. The reason behind this change likely lies in the instability of the main tanks during stage separation, when rapid shifts in G-forces, engine shutdowns, and the vehicle flip cause propellants to slosh violently. Especially now that the future Raptor V3 engines have increased thrust and the Block 3 ship is expected to carry three additional engines, the booster can experience intense negative G-forces during stage separation, further increasing the propellant sloshing. Although SpaceX has added baffles to minimize the effects of sloshing inside the main tanks, this motion could still disrupt the steady flow of propellants required to reignite the engines. By sourcing the boost back propellants from the header tanks integrated with the transfer tube, SpaceX effectively bypasses the unstable main tank environment and ensures a consistent and stable propellant supply to the engines. This design could also reduce or eliminate the need for baffles in the main tanks, saving mass and simplifying manufacturing. As always, these are early developments, and the full picture will come into focus in the weeks ahead. I'll keep you updated as more technical details emerge. And if you'd like a deeper dive into the Block 3 Starships and Super Heavy Boosters, be sure to check out my earlier videos linked in the description. Construction of the Gigabay Integration Facility reached a major milestone this past week. Following several weeks of extensive groundwork, crews have officially begun piling operations, signaling the shift from surface preparation to deep foundation construction. This will anchor the structure to stable subsurface layers, distributing its massive load to bedrock or compacted soil. The piling phase is expected to continue for several weeks, depending on soil conditions and the number of piles required. Once completed, crews will install pile caps or a raft foundation to link the piles into a unified base, followed by concrete pouring to form the ground slab. After curing, vertical construction will begin with steel columns, beams, and wall segments, similar to the construction techniques used for the High Bay and Mega Bay facilities. Gigabay is designed to be a high-throughput Starship manufacturing hub potentially producing over 1,000 vehicles annually. It will integrate advanced tooling, automated welding systems, and streamline supply chain operations to accelerate assembly. A similar Gigabay is under construction at SpaceX's Roberts Road site within Kennedy Space Center, where foundation concrete work is now underway. This facility will support Starship production for launches from Pad 39A. Meanwhile, major upgrades are progressing at LC-39A. Teams have begun cable reeving on the launch tower to connect it with the chopstick arms installed in January 2023. Soon, we could see chopstick actuation tests intended to evaluate their range of motion, operational behavior, and load-bearing capacity, allowing engineers to fine-tune the system before it becomes fully operational. Nearby, excavation work on the flame trench is ongoing and overall pad development is progressing to closely mirror the setup at Starbase's Pad B. The U.S. Air Force has canceled plans to build Starship landing pads on Johnston Atoll, 
a remote Pacific island and critical seabird sanctuary, citing environmental concerns. Originally announced in March as part of the Rocket Cargo Vanguard program, the project aimed to develop Johnston Atoll as a test site to demonstrate the rapid delivery of up to 100 tons of cargo anywhere on Earth within 90 minutes using commercial rockets. While SpaceX was never officially named, Starship is the only operational vehicle capable of meeting those goals. Johnston Atoll, located 800 miles southwest of Hawaii, was selected for its isolation and existing military infrastructure. The plan involved constructing two landing pads to support up to 10 landings per year. Following the announcement, the Air Force initiated an environmental assessment to examine the potential impact on Johnston Atoll's ecosystem, which supports over 1.5 million seabirds across 14 species. Although the draft report was originally expected in April, the project quickly faced growing opposition from biologists, environmental groups, and nearly 4,000 petitioners who warned that rocket landings could severely disrupt wildlife habitats and nesting behavior. Public concern was further amplified by past Starship launch failures and debris-related incidents, which have already raised environmental alarms. On July 3, the Air Force suspended the project without providing an official explanation, though the timing strongly suggests that mounting environmental backlash played a decisive role. Although Johnston Atoll is no longer an option, the rocket cargo program remains a strategic priority. The U.S. Air Force is actively assessing alternative sites for rapid logistics testing with commercial rockets, though the cancellation does represent a setback for near-term demonstrations. Now, let's discuss the latest updates from the world of science and technology. On July 2, astronomers confirmed the discovery of a rare interstellar comet, officially named 3I Atlas, marking it as only the third known interstellar object to pass through our solar system. Interstellar objects are celestial bodies originating from outside our solar system that have entered our cosmic vicinity at a remarkable speed. They're believed to be ejected from their original planetary systems by gravitational interactions during early planet formation, drifting through the galaxy for billions of years until they pass near another star system, like ours, to be detected. 3I Atlas was detected by the asteroid Terrestrial Impact Last Alert System, or ATLAS, a survey program run by the University of Hawaii that's designed to spot near-Earth objects. Classified as an active comet, it's already releasing gas and dust as sunlight heats its surface, forming a glowing coma and possibly a faint tail. Scientists estimate the nucleus, the solid core, of the comet, could be anywhere between a few hundred meters to up to 24 kilometers, though a smaller core is more likely based on its brightness. Initial spectroscopic observations suggest the comet contains a significant amount of water ice, and its activity is expected to increase as it nears the Sun, offering insights into its volatile chemistry. Unlike typical comets in our solar system, which orbit the Sun in an elliptical path, Comet 3I follows a hyperbolic trajectory, confirming it's not gravitationally bound to the Sun and will exit the solar system after a single pass. It's traveling at about 61 kilometers per second, well above the Sun's escape velocity. As of July 10, the comet is between the orbits of Jupiter and Mars, heading toward a safe flyby at roughly 250 million kilometers from Earth before exiting the solar system. Comet 3I is the third confirmed interstellar object to pass through our solar system. The first was Oumuamua, discovered in October 2017. It had no visible coma or tail and appeared as an elongated, possibly metallic object tumbling through space. Its unusual shape and trajectory sparked intense debate, including fringe theories about artificial origin. Comet 2I Borisov, discovered in August 2019, was the second interstellar visitor and the first confirmed interstellar comet with clear cometary activity. Due to their rarity, interstellar comets like 3I Atlas offer a unique window into the building blocks of other star systems, providing clues about the conditions and chemistry beyond our own. Thank you for tuning in for the latest science news and Starship updates. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, leave a comment, and share it with your friends. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you never miss an episode.